Our next speaker will be Kelly Verbs. Uh, he is also at the University of Waterloo, and she will be uh, talking about probing entanglement area loss uh, with particle detectors. And the floor is yours. You can start. Great. Thank you, Adam, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Kelly. I'm a PhD student at the University of Waterloo working with Eduardo. And I'm going to talk today about a project we've started this year along with Jose Polo Gomez and Bruno Torres, which aims to use particle detectors to probe entanglement area laws. And we are in the beginning stages of this work. And so my goal for this talk is just to give an overview of the problem that motivates this work, as well as the methods that we think are most promising to address in that. So first I'll discuss why we're interested in studying entanglement measures in QFT. And the basic reason is that Hilbert space is big and complicated. And this is the source of all the awesome physics that arises in quantum field theory. But it also means that in order to study all this awesome physics, we need tools that will allow us to organize the large amount of information that is present in Hilbert space. And over the last 40 years or so, the study of entanglement measures has proved to be very productive in this effort. In particular, uh, studying the entanglement structure involves breaking apart this big complicated Hilbert space into pieces that are more manageable. And we study how those pieces are correlated with other pieces. And this gives us enormous insight into the information content in quantum field theories. And it has led to a much deeper understanding of many branches of physics. The problem here is that the entanglement between partitions of Hilbert space is a really difficult thing to calculate in itself. If we have a pure state that we've divided into subregions A and B, the standard canonical measure of entanglement between these regions is the entanglement entropy, which is the von Neumann entropy of either reduced density matrix. However, our current methods of calculating this introduce their own problems. For example, without a UV cutoff, a naive calculation of the entanglement entropy will be divergent, but with a UV cutoff, it's not Lorentz invariant. And so we could also choose to define quantum fields in terms of operator value distributions. However, this limits us to only studying differences in entropy between systems. We could also calculate the density matrix elements by way of a Euclidean path integral and employ the replica trick, but this in itself is quite complex, which limits the complexity of systems that it can be applied to. And finally, in the last 20 years or so, uh, there have been some very fruitful applications of the Ru Takinagi formula, but with this, we're limited only to systems for which we have a holographic description. And moreover, detecting entanglement in mixed states is an even harder problem. We lose the interpretation of the von Neumann entropy as the entanglement shared across a bipartition, because, for example, even in a product state, the entanglement entropy of a subregion could be non-zero if it, ex it itself is a mixed state. And there are many measures uh, available for different situations, but few are ever calculable in practice. And further, in any case, we don't have a formalism for how entanglement is measurable. And so our goal is to uh, broaden the scope of systems in which we can study entanglement structure and do so in a way that is connected to experimental protocols. And so this is where particle detectors come in. So having seen the limitations that we discussed on the previous slides, there are three characteristics of particle detectors which suggest that they may be good probes of entanglement. For one, they're operational in nature, so they would provide a formula formulation of entanglement measures that is connected with experiments. And secondly, they are inherently regularized by way of a switching function, a smearing function, and a finite energy gap. And this will evade di divergences that we encounter working in the continuum limit. And thirdly, they're in principle applicable to regions of arbitrary shape, as well as disconnected regions and mixed states, making them much more practical than methods we currently have for computing entanglement. So what exactly would the setup look like? Well, the main elements of a system like this would involve the following. Say we wanna measure entanglement between a region and its complement. First, we have to have some coupling between a detector, which we'll take to be a single mode harmonic oscillator and the subregion of interest. Now, the ideal form of this coupling is really the most involved part of all of this. And so that's exactly what we'll be going in depth on in the rest of the slides. But for now, say we engineer some 
finite time interaction between the detector and the subregion. Then after the interaction has taken place, we can calculate the detector's entanglement with the complement region. And for a sufficiently short interaction time, any entanglement that we find between the de detector and the complement region has to have come from entanglement that was initially between these two regions. And so in this way, the detector could serve as a probe of the entanglement between regions of space-time. So now let's make things a bit more concrete in terms of what we're looking for here. Going back historically, the original interest in the topic of entanglement entropy and field theories came from the insight that the entropy of a black hole scales with the area of the surface at the event horizon. And this is actually even a more general feature. Uh, you can see that even the, the entropy of a vacuum state in flat space will obey the same scaling law if you choose your UV cutoff to be the Planck limit. So we say that these systems obey area laws, meaning that the entanglement grows propor proportionally with the boundary between the two partitions, or between the partitions. <clears throat> And the reason for this is that the vacuum of any quantum field is highly entangled with respect to spatial degrees of freedom. And thus, we observe entropy scaling with area in any local quantum field theory because all the correlations come from vacuum entanglement across the boundary. So seeing as area laws are a key feature of entanglement in QFTs, we can ask, is it possible to engineer an interaction between a particle detector and a quantum field beginning simply with flat vacuum of a free scalar field, which can transfer entanglement with enough efficiency to capture an area law. And to observe an area law, we would have to have an interaction that is very efficient at transferring entanglement to the detector. And for this very simple system of a one-dimensional lattice with only two oscillators, for example, we actually know how to do this perfectly. It's easy to write down and in fact, even easy to implement in practice an interaction which fully swaps the states of two single mode harmonic oscillators, such that all the entanglement present in oscillator A will be transferred into the detector and the detector will be entangled with B after the interaction. So we know how to do a perfect swap with a single mode, but we're interested in seeing how entanglement uh, scales, how entanglement entropy scales with increasing subsystem size. So how can we take inspiration from this to swap entanglement with larger regions? Well, I'll discuss perhaps the first two ways we may think of doing this coupling. And though we'll be presenting these interactions in a discretized form on a lattice, the ultimate application of this will involve taking the lattice spacing to zero to recover a true continuum. And Remember, we don't have to worry about divergences in this limit because the detector's sneering and energy gap provide the regularization for us. So though this will all be in ultimately in continuum, let's talk about how this could work on a lattice. First note that we can't do a direct swap between the detector's state and the state of all the oscillators because their phase spaces have different dimensions. But we could do something like swap the detector's position and momentum with the average position and momentum across all the sites in our subregion. But maybe unsurprisingly, this doesn't work so well because we're taking into consideration also all the sites in the interior that contain almost no entanglement with the exterior. So then the next idea may be to couple only to the sites at the boundary, uh, as this is where most of the entanglement should be concentrated. However, this actually is also not helpful in a naive application because these oscillators are just as entangled with the interior region as the exterior region. And so <clears throat> what results from a coupling to the boundary will not be reflective of the entanglement that the interior shares with the exterior. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we wanna know, is there any clever way to couple the detector to the boundary that evades this problem? Well, <clears throat> To be clever, we remember that we can achieve a perfect swap with a single mode. And so then we ask, can we identify the one mode of the interior that contains most of the entanglement and couple only to that mode? Now for this idea, it's important to point out that the ground state of a quantum field is a Gaussian state, <coughs> which is to say it's determined entirely by two-point correlation functions. And these comprise the covariance matrix. 
for anyone unfamiliar with Gaussian formalism, you can think of the covariance matrix as an analog of the density matrix, but in phase space rather than in Hilbert space for a Gaussian state. Okay. <laughs> okay, so once we have the covariance matrix of the full system, we just find the reduced covariance matrix of the subregion of interest by usual way of the partial trace. Then by performing a normal mode decomposition on the reduced covariance matrix, it's quite easy to identify the normal mode that contains most of the entanglement with the exterior region. And we know two things. A, that this mode will be supported entirely on the interior region. And B, that since normal modes are decoupled by construction, it won't be entangled with any other modes in the interior. So that means we're guaranteed that all of the measured entanglement in that mode comes exclusively from entanglement with the exterior region. And so then we just have to swap the detector mode with this mode. But how do we do this? Well, we look at how this mode is spatially spread across the oscillators in the lattice. So as expected, this mode is concentrated at the boundary in the cases we've seen so far, but it's not equally weighted among the boundary oscillators. And also uh, in 2D, you can see participates in the interior oscillators just to a lesser extent. And it is by finding this spatial distribution of the mode among the degrees of freedom of the interior oscillators that tells us exactly the spatial smearing function that we need in the continuum limit in order to couple only to the mode that contains the majority of the entanglement. In other words, uh, the spatial distribution of the mode tells us exactly the strength with which we need to couple our detector at each point in space. And with this interaction, we expect to be able to swap the majority of the entanglement contained in a given spatial region into our detector, thereby measuring the entanglement of that region. And with that, I'll conclude by saying that we've discussed how quantifying entanglement has been both illuminating and elusive over the past few decades, and just how helpful it would be to have a method of quantifying entanglement that is measurable, calculable in practice, and widely applicable. And I've shared some promising ideas stemming from a project using particle detectors as a tool to measure entanglement in field theories. And we hope that we can soon recover area laws using this protocol. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Great time. So we have time for a short question if someone wants to ask it. Okay, so go ahead, Mr. Pio. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so you consider the vacuum state entanglement and you consider the area law for the entanglement, right? Vacuum state entanglement. But uh, if you can use the same method to a finite temperature entanglement between two systems, then you may observe the breaking um, of the area law. Mm -hmm. uh, if you increase the temperature, it may be interesting. So, in at the high temperature regime, in the high temperature regime, you have a volume law for the entanglement entropy, right? Yes. So, when so the behavior change, it may be very interesting to follow. So, first in the low temperature, you have an area law, but uh, uh, increasing the temperature, that you may have a volume law. Yeah. So, yeah, it may be interesting to explore the dynamics. I yeah. Just comment. Yeah, I agree. And also with more non-local field theories that produce. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. And I that's also interesting. The, I see the reproduction of area laws as a guiding principle and a proof of concept of this to uh, make sure we're reco recovering the right results. And then it will be very interesting to venture into more unknown territory with this and be able to. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your question.